is a guy named E.N. Gray. He spent his life searching for the one trait that is common to all successful people. And he, he wrote an essay about it entitled, The Common Denominator of Success. And from his, his research, his study of this topic, he, he found that successful people's common characteristic wasn't hard work, or good luck, or uh, great ability in human relations. Those traits were important, but he said the one factor that seemed to transcend every, every other characteristic of people who were successful is they had a distinct ability to put first things first, to make the things that should be important actually important. This is what Gray wrote. The successful person has the habit of doing the things failures don't like to do. Now, they don't like to do them either necessarily, but their disliking is subordinated to the strength of their purpose. I want to begin today, and this is, a, this is a lot like a New Year's sermon, because this season of the year is a time when it, it's a good season to say, what, how do, what do I need to lean into in this time in my life? What needs to be new? What needs to be put away? What needs to be taken up? So, at the beginning of a new school year, beginning of a new church year, it's a good time to do this, and I like to do it from a little book that may not be that familiar to many of you, uh, an Old Testament book called Haggai. It's named for the prophet Haggai. Now, Haggai is the shortest, second shortest book in the Old Testament. What's the shortest book in the Old Testament? There's a right answer to this. It's not a trick question this time. <laughs> shortest book is big and bold like you mean it. In the Old Testament. Obadiah. Oh. There was actually a prize that went with that. A gift card to your favorite restaurant. But <laughs> because uh, no one won that award, I'll keep it for myself. Yeah. Uh, the second shortest book in the Old Testament is the book of Haggai. And it's a message put first things first. It was written to people, though, like us. And here's how it's like us. Because they said, well, we know what we should put first. We know how the order should, what life should look like, what the order of life should look like. We're just having a little difficulty actually doing it. I mean, it's not in not knowing what you should do that we get, that we get stuck. It's in, it's in not doing something about it. So here's what happened. The people that Haggai is ministering to, they just drifted away from the truth that God should be first, and not just first, and uh, I'm going to use that kind of language all the way through, so I wanted to find it early on. When I say God is first, that doesn't mean that there's this pie, and it's carved up into all the little pieces of pie, all these little slivers of pie, and God first means God is one of the slivers in my pie. Just so you know, this is how it works. When, when we say God is first, it means God's Lord over the pie. How about that? It's all God's pie. It's not just, well, this is a little God piece, and then here's the work piece and the family piece. And God is, God is Lord over all pie. He's Lord over every sliver of your life. He's, he's king over the whole thing. That's what it means for God to be first. So let's start out with that bit of definition. Here's what happened in Haggai's day. They were living with these misplaced priorities. He was sent to help the people get their priorities in line with what they really, they knew what they should be. And it's one of the best, uh, best books in the Bible for turning a corner, getting a fresh start in this season. I think it's appropriate for what we're about. So Haggai's a prophet. He is a contemporary with a prophet, Zechariah. Since Haggai's usually just a couple of pages in an English translation of a Bible, if you turn over, the next guy's Zechariah. And they were contemporaries. They lived at the same time. They're preaching to the same people at the same time with much the same message. So Zechariah moves into, Zechariah points a whole lot toward Jesus. So he's a fascinating guy in the Old Testament. But a big part of their ministry was on a specific step for God's people. They needed to jumpstart the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. What had happened is because of multiple, multiple rebellions against God, God had allowed oppressors to come in on his people. 
One of those oppressors were the Babylonians. And the Babylonians just got tired of the Jewish people, especially in and around Jerusalem and the villages that were in the area, just rebelling over and over and over again. Just a thorn in their side that they decided, we don't want to do this anymore. So in 587, 586, they come marching into Jerusalem and they took it apart. The Bible describes it this way, that not one stone was left upon another. That The destruction was so complete that there wasn't anything that was connected to anything else with, rock, with, the, with the building stones and city anymore. They took it apart and they destroyed the temple of Solomon in that process. The, the symbol of the presence of God with his people, the worship of God built around that place, they destroyed it. By the time you get to Haggai's life, he's, uh, we've had a few groups of Jews that have begun returning to Israel from Babylonian captivity. And they'd gotten started, and they had finally completed the foundation of the temple. This was a, a big task, but they at least got, the, got that part done. And it was a big, big job, and they were happy about that. And they started doing, offering sacrifices to God again at that location. But the overall building project, it had uh, stalled out. So Haggai's a helpful guy. He is helpful in dating his prophecy. In verse 1, it, you get a lot of numbers. The second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. And we take that, that bit of numbers and we say, this happened on or about 520 BC. We know exactly when this has taken place. So that really helps us with a lot of things in understanding the, the background, the structure of what's taken place in this little book of Haggai. Zerubbabel who's still one of my favorite people to ever say out loud. <laughs> Zerubbabel had led uh, one of the first groups out of exile back to Jerusalem about 15, 16 years or so earlier. They had come back. They had been a part of at least getting things going again. Along comes Haggai, and in 520, he and Zechariah, they go at it trying to inspire these guys. you got to finish the temple. And so about 516 B.C., they complete the temple. Not quite as glorious as it was in Solomon's day, a pretty far shot, but it's back and it's been established. Then you go another several years, maybe as many as 40 years later, and you have Ezra and you have Nehemiah coming a little while later. And those two guys, they inspire the people, rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, get life back the way it should be, establish worship at the temple to be what God intended for it to be because it had gotten a little corrupt. So if you find your way to Haggai, his prophetic words ought to be an inspiration to us to get moving into this new season. And not, not just with willpower and determination, like I'm just going to try harder and do better, but with a faith-filled resolve, uh, eyes of faith, a heart of hope to say, I don't have to remain where I am, but God has bigger things and better things for me, and I'm not going to be satisfied to uh, just be where I have been. Now, so don't miss this. Haggai spoke this message to Jews that had returned from Babylon. They'd been living in captivity there. Uh, the temple had been destroyed some 70 years earlier. They begin returning from exile, and they face this task of rebuilding. The first returnees, they get the, they get the foundation rebuilt. The surrounding people are the Samaritans. They're different in their religion. They have some things in common, but it's a perversion of the true worship of God. The Samaritans say, hey, we're all in this together now. Why don't, we, don't you let us help you out on this little construction project of yours? And the Jewish people say, no, this is, this is a unique worship of God, different than what you've been doing. And it really made them mad. And so they started sending all this correspondence back to the Persians who were at that point in charge. and said, These people are really rebellious, bad people. You shouldn't let them rebuild this temple. And the Persians shut them down. And so everything is dead. Uh, nothing's moving. Years passed. And slowly what happens is that Jerusalem starts coming to life again. The people build houses. And they open shops and businesses and they plant fields and they harvest crops. And uh, life is returning to something that resembles normalcy for these people. Meanwhile, the temple is still just a slab uh, grown over by weeds after multiple years. And here's what's happened. 
the people of Israel got used to life without a temple. They got used to life being the way it was. It, it wasn't that they, they one day said, we want to rebel against God and just thumb our nose at the priorities that God has established. They just got comfortable doing something other than that. And that, that foundation overgrown by weeds stands as a silent reminder of the Jews' failure to take care of God's house. And you know, it's not the building, it's not the brick and mortar that's the big deal. But when that, that symbol wasn't there, when there wasn't the gathering place for worship, then the people, they didn't worship much in between either. And, and the day-to-day, week-to-week stuff, it, it fell away too when there wasn't that place. And that place represented the presence of God with His people. And when that place wasn't where it needed to be, God's presence in the lives of His people wasn't where it needed to be either. And there, there's a lot of... There's a lot of distance spiritually between God and their personal knowledge of Him. So, they're not taking care of God's house. So, 14, 16 years passed. Haggai appears on the scene, and he has this one prevailing message. It's time to finish rebuilding the temple. It's time to put first things first. It's time to establish priorities. This is the center for worship of God. And it, the, the temple represented the heart and soul of the Old Testament religion, and We know God is everywhere, but the tangible presence of the place of worship was important. And it's still important that we gather. That we gather for us. We find it in the book of Acts, chapter 2. We'll talk about this a lot in the next six, six or eight weeks. The people gathered at the temple in the New Testament in a large gathering. Then they gathered house to house in small gatherings. And so we seek to still follow that pattern today in our church where we gather together like this. And then we think everybody, whether you do it before you get here or for our early service, they come here first and then go to a small group. You'd be in a smaller group where you're actually doing the one another things of the Bible together. Love one another, pray for one another, care for one another. You're going through life together with a group of people. You need both of those things to grow. And so the temple is a mess. It's an embarrassment and bring shame on the reputation of God too. It's not just about them having their priorities scrambled. But it's affecting their testimony to the glory of God. So Haggai's message is fairly blunt. He doesn't have a lot of filter. He just lays it out there for the people. I want to begin reading in Haggai chapter 1 verse 1. I've given you a lot of time to find this book. Uh, it's part of my effort. If, if, you, if you went all the way to Matthew, you have overshot your target. But not by a lot. So if you'll back up, just Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai. You're almost there. Here we go. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, their names are going to show up in some of these prophetic books in the Old Testament. Uh, Zerubbabel, Shealtiel, where else do they show up? Matthew chapter 1. Because when Matthew lays out the genealogy of Jesus, those two guys are blood descendants that are going to show up in Jesus' genealogy. This also makes them a big deal in the Bible. So, you may not be that familiar with them, but uh, they're connected very closely to Jesus. Here's what it says. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You've sown much, harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And I like this last part of verse 6. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Any of you feel like you have holes in your pockets? Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He repeats it. 
Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much and behold, it came to little. You, you brought it home, it blew away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? That why are these bad things happening? Why is the life working out? Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above, above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I've called for a drought on the land and on the hills and on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and on all their labors. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. It's a great message. I need this message on a regular basis. I am with you, declares the Lord. Now, I want to run through some things from these verses about just getting a good start, a fresh start, uh, beginning again and making first things first. Here's the first thing that I, I learned from Haggai. Stop making excuses. That's the first lesson. Stop making excuses. You have an outline there. I hope you use it to jot down a few things here. Haggai says, you guys are so full of excuses about why the temple is still in ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts. These people say, well, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. It wasn't like it wasn't on their radar. They knew, well, we ought to. You, you're all full up with I oughtas. I really, I know I should. I feel like I ought to. I know most, you're not, you, you're smart folk. You, most of us know what God wants us to do. Most of us know what God wants us to do next. But we're really good excuse makers. So they gave all kinds of excuses why they couldn't get around to it yet. If you ask them, oh, I'm for building the temple. It's a great cause. But, but see, the thing is, it's my, it's my season of life. And where I am and with my family. Well, things are really crazy at work right now. As soon as this gets taken care of and that straightens out, then I can get around to, to making God everything God is supposed to be. Eventually we're going to build it, just not now. And uh, we have a lot of just not now in relationship to God. And they made excuses. Billy Sunday is an evangelist of another generation. He, he defined an excuse this way. He said an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. How about that? Benjamin Franklin wrote, I never knew a man who was good at making excuses who was good at anything else. It's always easy to make excuses when you don't want to do what God wants you to do. And you can find a rational justification for it. And we're good at excuses, and we're good at rationalizing our lives, and we're good at justifying what we do and what we don't do. The time's not right, family stuff, my kids settle down at work, I can... Then, oh, but then, oh, you'd be amazed at all the things. And a lot of people go through their whole life with all those excuses, and they end their run with a lot of, a lot of undone things. The first step to putting things right, to putting first things first, is to admit our responsibility. Most of the time, you do not have to work hard to see what God wants you to do. If you're you're new to our church, one of the phrases we use a lot here is uh, next steps. Everybody has a next step with God. And most of us probably know, this is my next step. I really know what I should do next. It's not a shock to me. It's not a surprise. It's not a mystery. What God wants from me, you likely know something about your next step with God. The breakdown is we're so much better at making excuses than we are about taking steps. Take responsibility. A good example of this and how it works out, Luke chapter 10, he talks about Jesus and he had a couple of friends, two ladies that contributed to his ministry, blessed his life, Mary and Martha. You remember the story of Mary and Martha? And Martha She always had the best of intentions. She just couldn't keep focused on things long enough to do it because she had so much stuff to do. It says, but Martha, Luke 10, 40, was distracted with much serving. You know, she wasn't wasn't terrorizing her neighbors. She, She was a nice person. She was doing good things. But Martha was missing the most important thing, putting first things first. Jesus was at the house and she was busying around 
sort of wanting to do stuff for Jesus when she really needed to be with Jesus. And it's just getting the priorities where they need to be. And that's where, that's where it got scrambled for her. Martha was distracted with her many tasks. Do all the things on your to-do list distract you from focusing on God? This is a good season for me to say something that, that I've said before. If you ask people in this part of the world, in good old North Texas, so how's life? How are things going for you right now? The answer, especially this time of year when everything's gearing up, you already feel it, you're already experiencing it. Life is so, so sinful. Yes, exactly. Yeah, sinful. Yeah, busy, because there's so many things to do, and there's so much to do, and you say, you know, Chad, you're saying I should take a next step with God, and that's just asking too much of me, and I can't take a next step with God, and here's why I can't take a next step with God, because I just can't get it all done. It's just too much. The list is too long. I can't get it all done. And I want to give you a liberating word today. This is, this is my liberating word for you to set you free. It's not all worth doing. It's just not all worth doing. And there are a thousand and one opportunities. And we live in a part of the world where there's just a lot of things you could do. A lot of ways you can use your time and your talent, your, your, your resources. There's all kinds of things you can do. But it's not all worth doing. But we'll fill up our schedules and we will overcrowd our children's lives with stuff. And they are running from here to there and everywhere and they're all stressed out. It's not all worth doing. And it won't make a hill of beans a difference a month from now, certainly not a year from now or 10 years from now, when we pile up all this stuff in our lives. And we just need to be ruthless sometimes about getting rid of stuff and clearing the schedule. You don't have to have it all. You don't have to do it all. Nobody's holding a gun to your head saying you have to do it all. God doesn't expect you to do it all. You have the time. You have the energy. You have the ability to take a next step with God. To grow spiritually. To become more like Jesus. To, to know Him better and love Him more. The question is, will you take the time? And it is a choice. And we are making choices about this. Not just on what we're going to do on a Sunday. But we're making choices about this every day. And we have to take responsibility for this. We can't put it off on, it's my employer's fault, it's my wife's fault, it's my kid's fault, it's my parents' fault. We have to take responsibility for our own lives. Let me give you a verse, Psalm 39.6. I like this in the New Living Translation. It says, all our busy rushing ends in nothing. That's one you should put on your bathroom mirror at home. Uh, where are you going to see it? Some place where you're going to see it a lot. Our, all our busy rushing ends in nothing. Uh, if you want more time in your life, there's a, there's a verse, this is in the Living Bible. It says, reverence for the Lord adds hours to each day. I like how that runs. Put God in his rightful place. He's Lord over everything. He's in charge. It's his pie. And stop making excuses. You know, why is God getting sidelined in your life and your priorities? Why does he keep getting pushed away? Take responsibility because you've allowed it, you've encouraged it, you've embraced it. Uh, Take responsibility. Second thing, cease being selfish. Uh, Verses 3 and 4. Closely aligned with making excuses is a selfish mindset. It permeates everything. Here's how Haggai says it to the people in Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, he's talking about the temple, lies in ruins? This is an idiom. Uh, idioms are ways of saying things in another language. It doesn't always translate directly. It's a, it's a saying, and here's what it means. It's not just talking about uh, well, God is against paneling. Uh, it's a little more complex than that. Uh, it, it means they, they, they were in their houses, and they were comfortable in their houses, and they'd been saying for a long time, well, once we get our, you know, get our stuff taken care of, then we can start working on the temple. But now, they're adding a lot of amenities to their houses. And the temple's still in ruins. Still weeds on the foundation. They're, oh, I'm going to, let's add on that sunroom we've been wanting. And let's do this. And, let's, and, they, and, they, and they're adding on to their homes while still neglecting to take a step with God. Now, understand, there's nothing wrong with having a nice home. Some of the most spiritual people, godly people, influential people in the Bible were, were well-off people. But there were people who recognized the whole pie belongs to God. 
And whatever God entrusts to me, I'm going to use it in ways that are going to honor him and bring him glory. So it's not an attack on houses or uh, riches. They're saying, don't, don't pour yourself into, into all those things to the point that you squeeze God out of the picture. That God doesn't have his rightful place on the throne of, of, of everything. And it's not just fix up the temple. It's our lives are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's God's dwelling in us. That temple is just a reminder, once a week at least, that He's dwelling in us all the time. You get far from that once a week and it all starts to get blurry for a whole lot of folks. So He's just saying, stop being selfish. Don't leave the things of God undone while you're pursuing selfish things. So they're making excuses. Yeah, God, this is why God's getting left out. We don't have time. We don't have money. We don't have margin. So God, in that list, as soon as it gets tight, the God stuff, God and the things of God, that's what gets squeezed out because he's the variable that's negotiable because you couldn't possibly give up all the other things on that list. And Haggai challenges us, not so much. You can't leave God and the things of God undone. It's just an indictment of... Uh, Misplaced priorities. So, energy, entertainment, ease, they're being consumed by those things. I'm going to give you an example. Brace yourselves. Lash yourself to the pew. It's going to be difficult. You've seen this. You've seen that. You have seen this. This is a multi generational issue. The person who says, you know, we just really can't make it to our Bible fellowship group this Sunday. We're not going to make it to church because we're just so tired because we've been going so hard all weekend. We just, don't, we just need to rest for another busy week this week. And then you pop open social media and you discover all morning and all afternoon on Sunday, they have been going hard and long doing a thousand and one things. Now, I know several of you are saying... Unfriend, 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 unfriend. <laughs> but you got to unfriend everybody because it's not just me that sees it. Everybody else sees it too, right? And God sees it. Don't miss that part of the story. That God knows when we use whatever the excuse is on ourselves and, and God just gets squeezed out of the picture. Here's why that happens. It's easy to drift away from God and His agenda and to embrace just our own stuff. It's easy to pursue selfish desires and ignore what God wants. In fact, the default mode of our life is always away from God because that's the nature of a sinful heart. And even when you have, you've given your life to Jesus, you're a Christian, you're saved, you're bound for heaven, we still have that sin nature that is a constant tug and it's pulling us away from God into selfish things. The bent of our heart is always towards selfishness Selfishness. And that's what happened to the Jews that Haggai was talking to. Uh, there's a guy, songwriting guy, William Cowper. You familiar with William Cowper? You have all of his greatest hits on your playlist, William Cowper? You should, because we've already sung one of his greatest hits. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Because I'm really not tuned into you a lot of times. And then that the third or fourth verse, he says, of his own heart, as he knew, he knew William Cowper. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I feel the magnetic attraction of drifting from God toward anything and everything else. So, what happens? Well, when we don't persistently, consistently seek God first above all things, we're going to miss God's blessing. That brings to the third thing. Don't miss God's blessings. How about that? As a consequence of all their excuse making, their selfish living, in Haggai's day they experienced hardship. And he goes through that list. Uh, sown much, harvested little, eat, never have enough, drink, never have your fill, clothe yourselves, no one's warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. 
they sowed plenty of seed, but the crops didn't yield, and certainly not as much as they hoped. And they had these active lifestyles, but they're not experiencing any satisfaction or joy and how life is going. They're laboring, but there's no profit. No matter how hard they tried, it seemed like they were spinning their wheels. And as much, no matter how much money they managed to accumulate, it seemed to just fall out like there were holes in their pockets. And why? Well, because... Because of their selfishness, the people were missing God's blessings. And it's more than that. See, it's not just missing God's blessings. It's inviting God's discipline. And this one is something we don't talk about nearly enough. The Bible talks about it constantly. The one whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, the Bible says. And so we we look at our lives and go, why isn't this working out? Why isn't this working out? Why isn't this working out? And one of the questions you need to ask is, am I doing something that God is saying, Okay, you're sort of drifting this way, and I need to just nudge you back in the right direction. A loving discipline of the Lord to get us back on track. And sometimes things don't work out because God's saying, just wanted to remind you, I'm here, and and i really like to spend more time with you. And sometimes He's protecting us from things that are wrong and destructive and hurtful to ourselves or others, and He disciplines us. Sometimes the blessing is lifted. Sometimes it is the discipline of God that, it, that is the mark of blessing lifted. And Haggai gives us that sobering reminder that whatever happens in your heart affects every other area of your life. And when your heart is far from God, it starts touching everything else. The people who pushed God out of the center and they were suffering because of it. What they did not see was that God was causing their predicament. Now, often when things go bad, we say, God, you must fall, you're falling down the job because I'm having difficulty. I'm having problems. Things that life isn't smooth. I'm not always healthy and happy and, and things are go, easy going. Well, maybe, maybe you need to examine where you are in relationship to God. Is at least one of the questions to consider. They hadn't considered God's trying to tell them something. So Haggai just screamed it. God who control, it's God who controls the rain and the harvest, and he's withholding his blessing. Maybe there's some godly discipline going on, but that's the reason for the predicament you're in. Your priorities aren't right. Jesus said it this way. When people are saying, what about what I eat? What about what I drink? What about what I wear? What about all this? He said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those other things that get complicated and that we tend to consume ourselves with, they'll be added unto you. I'll take care of those things too. Blessings come through obedience. And if we want to experience God's blessings, God needs to be in that place where he's over everything. Seek him, seek him first. Now, fourth thing, take time to evaluate. Verse 5, verse 7, same, same thing in both verses. Consider your ways, Haggai says. So this is a pretty good indictment he's laid on these people. A terrible predicament they're in. The people realize they had caused their own misfortune. They're starting to feel it, starting to understand the message. They're ready to evaluate twice. Consider your ways. Uh, The word consider means to carefully examine. To to not just assume things are going to work out, but to carefully examine. Give careful thought to. It was time for the people to do some serious self-examination before the Lord. Haggai just wants them to stop long enough in their busy schedules to evaluate their life in the light of God's Word. So that's how that works. You say, okay, here's my life, and here's God's Word, and those things are not aligned. And so as I consider my life, I want it to be like that, but it's not like that. And unless we ask the question, we're not ever going to see where we are misaligned. Evaluation is a good thing. Teachers give tests. Employers give job reviews. Socrates wrote, the unexamined life is not worth living. So each day we evaluate. How am I going to spend my time? How am I going to spend my money? How am I going to use the talents that God has entrusted to me? We should examine, who are my friends? What are my goals? What priorities am I setting in my life? And, and not just what I, my good intentions of God's first in my life and then everything else and Is that really true? Is there any evidence that would verify that in in your life that people who know you best, love you most even, would say, oh yeah, the evidence is plentiful that that is absolutely how you're doing this. Could you be convicted of it if you were brought up on charges of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Or would it be really blurry? 
and when the witnesses have conflicting testimony. If God is not in that rightful place, the top of everything, uh, that's on us. The failure to make constant corrections each day is uh, like a pilot who does not make slight course adjustments in flight. Just a little bit. It doesn't seem like much. But if you add another little bit and another little bit and another little bit and you give it some time, one day you wake up and you're just a long way from God and a long way from the things of God. But it works like this. The, a person that is our simple description of an unchurched person. You're unchurched if you haven't attended church for any reason besides a wedding or funeral in the last six months. That's an unchurched person. But I know a lot of people that they've gone decades away from a relationship to the people of God, the body of Christ, the church. And it didn't start out with them saying, I'm, I'm going to reorient my priorities. And starting today, I'm hoping that 20 years from now, I am just light years away from a relationship to God being right. That my kids wouldn't even be able to identify that I'm a Christian. Uh, I don't think that that's where people start. I think it starts, you know how you get to be unchurched? Missing one Sunday may get you started. I mean, it's, it's the first one. that it's, just, it's, not, it's not even discernible. You just missed a day. Maybe you were really, really sick. We didn't want you here. But, but then it's, oh, and then I have something else. And then I have something else and something else. And that's just one example of just attend, being a part of a church family. But there's so many other layers of this that just a slight deviation from leaning right into the Lord. And before long, you just wake up one day and you're a long way from God and you've taken your family a long way from God and you say, how did I end up here? When we stop making excuses, when we cease being selfish, when we seek God's blessings, when we take time to evaluate, we can start seeing God working in powerful ways in our lives. And that's what happens when first things are first, when God is... He's first over everything in our hearts. How do we know when we're putting first things first? What does it look like? It's one thing to say, yeah, it is, yeah that's God's first. What, is it, what does it start looking like? And this is three things, and these won't take very long. Here's the first one. We're, we're going to be active in the right things. That's easy enough. There's me, there are measurables to this. It's not a, I never know where I am in my relationship to God. There, there are ways to measure this. There are things that you can say, okay, well, that's a pretty good indicator. For these people, Haggai says in verse 8, go up to the hills. See, they're struggling with making first things first. So he he tells them, okay, I'm not going to tell you to do a hundred things. I'm just going to tell you to do one thing. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. God said, I'm not going to ask you to do everything. I'm not going to ask you to sacrifice a thousand sheep or whatever you want to. Here's what I want you to do. What's messed up is the house of the Lord's still a mess. So, step one. Go find a tree. Cut down the tree. And then bring it back to Jerusalem. Because until we have trees, we can't make... They can't create the lumber that's going to build the temple. So, you don't have to fix everything today. Just go cut down a tree. Now, what is that one thing for you? Because once you take a... You're drifting off, drifting off, drifting off. And what's the one thing that would just... That would just be that course correction for you? That would start opening up all these other doors of opportunity for growth and experiencing God and serving Him and, 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 and knowing how real He is. What is that one just simple course correction? That's for them, just go cut down a tree. And if you just do that, you're going to be leaning back into the right direction again. And for you, what is the one thing? And we talked about this at the first hour. You know, some, some people, it's just, I'm going to make an effort to be here on Sunday morning. The pews aren't like a lounger or something, but they're not excruciatingly painful. It's heated and cooled. I think I can can do an hour in worship with God's people. 
or uh, for, for everybody. Everybody, you really need the large group experience and the small group experience because there are two different dynamics that God works in in those two things. So I'm going to be in a Bible fellowship group with other adults where I'm going to get to know some people and they're going to find out I don't have it all together. And just so, just so you know, they don't have it all together either. But together, there's a lot of things God can do with you. So you say, I'm, I'm going to be a part of a Bible fellowship group. Or you look at the front of the bulletin and you say, really? I have, put, I have said, well, the time's just not right for reading my Bible every day. And you know, that chapter a day, that could take me three, four minutes maybe. I don't have that kind of time. Because we've been making excuses and justifying, but I could read my Bible every day. And 1 John is such an encouraging book. So 1 John chapter 1, chapter 2, you probably do two chapters today. And you could jump in on the Bible reading plan of the rest of the church and start, start your day just with that simple little exercise of reading from God's Word. And that's the thing that just, just helps to put you in a different spot. I know I should be serving somewhere in the church. A thousand and one ways you can do that. Uh, from long-term commitments to one-time things. But just to say, I'm going to do something different than what I've been doing. I'm going to take a step. I'm going to cut down a tree. Just the simple stuff. Just do one step. But start doing something now that points you in the right direction. Then God's glorified. When you're going in the right direction, when first things are first, God's going to be glorified. Why should the temple be rebuilt? That God would be glorified. When God is not first, we're indifferent to God's glory. God's fame, God's reputation being spread, it's just not important to us. So we're not worried about the people that live around us that are going to go to hell for all eternity unless somebody tells them about Jesus because we're not interested in God's glory going forward. But when, when your priorities are where they need to be, in everything, you say, okay, I'm going to work and I'm... At my work, I make widgets, and it's not very exciting, but I make widgets, and they give me a paycheck, and I'm able to have a house and a car and feed my family, so that's good. I make widgets, but when you go to make widgets, and you go knowing the glory of God is your priority, then suddenly the world of widgets is a mission field, and you have a purpose to be there that's way beyond widgets. And, and God starts doing big and beautiful things through your life. And when you go to the, when you're standing on a sidelines at a soccer practice, you're not just doing what you do because I got to do this because I'm a dad or I'm a mom and this is just what the cards have for me to stand here in the heat or in the freezing cold while this is happening. But these people all around me, God put me here for a reason. I'm not here by accident. I'm seeking God's glory while I'm here. That means I'm on mission. This is God's, God's working around me. And that's true in every environment of your life you find yourself. You're not there by accident. You're there for the glory of God. And then the last thing, when, when you know that first things are first, God blesses. God blesses us. When the people obeyed, God sent the word. Chapter 1, verse 13, I am with you. And when God is first, he blesses. And a sure sign of his blessing is his manifested presence that you just know. When, when I am, I, I know it on any given day, because see, sometimes I can go great for a long time. Then I have one day where my mind's just on other stuff and God gets squeezed out even in a day. And I'm working at the church, but I'm taking care of business and I'm going to meetings and I'm doing this and I'm making decisions and doing all this stuff. And the glory of God part can get squeezed out for a pastor too. And so when I know that I'm in the right direction, first things are first, is when that conversation with God is so vivid and he's talking to me and I'm getting those little prompts all through the day about conversations I should have. And oh, this is when God's talking to you. When when you get the prompt, you really ought to call. You really ought to send a note. You really should go and check on somebody. When, when, when those prompts start coming fast and furious, I know I'm right in the middle of where God wants me to be today because God is with me. He is on me today. 
And he is guiding me. And the relationship is not far, far away. But it's vivid. And it's all up close. And it's eternal. And there's that awareness of his presence. And that's where the big blessing of life comes in for me. And for these people. And for you. Now, I want to encourage you. Out of all the things that we've talked about. Just that, that one thing. He tells them, just go cut down a tree. Just do, just do something. What is the cut down a tree moment for you today? That one thing that you know you've been holding back, that you know you should do, that you know needs to open up in your life, that you, you've made excuses about, you've, you've held up. What's the one thing and, and what are you going to do about it?